future of technology, we've got the Agendas Week in Review. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. It's Friday, March 12th, and that's ahead on the Agenda. What plays the bigger part in life, luck or skill? And how much control do we have, if any? Maria Konnikova took her PhD in psychology and her writing skills to the poker table to find out, and won. Well, we all win since it's produced her new book, The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Maria Konnikova is also a contributing writer for The New Yorker magazine, and she's with us now on the line from Vermont. Hi, Maria. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to chat with you. I loved the book. Um, I think I'm going to keep it on my bedside table. But uh, you went to an Ivy League school, have a successful career as a writer with The New Yorker. Where did it, the idea to take a year off come from to learn poker? Originally, it had nothing to do with poker, and I didn't know that poker was going to be the route I was I would eventually take. I became fascinated by the role that chance plays in our lives, and it was a personal fascination. A lot of things went wrong um, at around the same time, and about everything that you think can go wrong went wrong. I mean, my health just fell apart. My grandmother died. Multiple people in my family lost their jobs. Just all of these things within one month, one right after the other. They forced me to really take a step back and realize how big a role chance plays in a day-to-day -day life and that we can work hard and do our best and that will only get us so far. We also have to get lucky. Things also have to go our way. And I wanted to write about that. I wanted to explore it. I wanted to figure out how do you learn to tell the difference? How do you learn to maximize the things that you can have agency over while not letting the things that are outside of your control drag you down. And that eventually brought me to poker as um, a way of exploring this. Um, I think too, uh, when we have success, we, when we have success in our lives, I don't know if we're really saying, why am I being so successful? Oh, me. It's only when bad things happen. So how, what role does the ego play when we are trying to decipher whether our success is due to luck or to hard work? Huge, huge. I mean, our ego is just overwhelming. And it's so tempting to say when things go well, I'm a genius, I'm brilliant. Yep, I, I knew that was gonna happen. And when things go poorly, we have so many excuses. Oh, you know what? No one could have predicted this and no one could have predicted that. It was out of my hands. All of a sudden, we're not such a big shot anymore, but it's all other things. If it were just up to us, we'd be totally successful. There's so many psych studies about this that show that if you ask people these questions, if you put them in these sorts of situations, they'll take credit for success and they'll blame other people, other things other externalities for failure. Um, that's not true. That's not actually reality. I think that it's always a mixture of both. You know, we, you have to, you have to do well, but you also have to get lucky. And when things don't go your way, a lot of times it's your fault too. Yes, you got unlucky, but it's also your fault and you have to learn those lessons the hard way. Our ego blinds us. We don't want to hear that. We just, we just want to move on with life. So a lot of us, when we think of poker, uh, it's gambling, it's a game. Um, and you said that you had no experience playing card games. At one point, you didn't know how many cards are in a deck. I didn't either until I read your book. <laughs> but yet you decide to spend a year of your life learning to play and master poker. Why poker uh, specifically? Well, I got the idea from one of the legends of the 20th century, John von Neumann, who was just this brilliant mind, total polymath, the father of the computer. So you and I would not be able to have this interview without him. Also the father of game theory, also one of the inventors of the hydrogen bomb. So lots of lots of things that, uh, that this guy was responsible for, some better than others. But he was a poker player. And in his book, The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, which is the foundational text of game theory, he writes that poker was actually the basis of game theory. And that the reason that he chose poker was that because to him, it embodied 
what strategic decision making was in life, because both poker and life are games of incomplete information. What that means is that there are things I know, there are things you know, there are things we know in common. And then what we have to do is make the best decision we possibly can based on limited information and information that will never be complete. So we have to make decisions in an uncertain environment and we need to know that it's always going to be probabilistic. There's no such thing as certainty. There's no no such thing as 100%. That's life. That's poker. And to me, when I read that, I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Maybe poker is a way into a lot of the themes that I want to talk about. And there was one more thing he wrote. He said, real life consists of bluffing, of little tactics of deception, of trying to figure out what does this man think I mean to do? And that's what games are about in my theory. And as a psychologist, that really appealed to me. I thought, yes, exactly. For a mathematician to realize that you need psychology, you need the human element, that it can't all be reduced down to numbers. To me, that was groundbreaking, and that made me want to learn more about poker. Chess, I think, is a board game that everybody uh, holds to a certain... Um, uh, every, people talk about chess. If you can play chess, you're a genius, you're fantastic, and all that. <laughs> how, is, um, how is poker different from other uh, games that we play in casinos or even something like chess? So von Neumann, like me, did not like chess. I'm so glad that he and I shared that <laughs> because that, that makes me feel slightly better. And he found chess boring. And the reason he found chess boring was because it's a game of perfect information. There's a board, you see all the pieces, you see all the permutations, and theoretically, with enough computing power, there's always a right move. So there's always something that you can do. And it's a game that's solvable, and indeed, that's been solved. Poker and life are not like that. Those are games of incomplete information. So imagine a chessboard, but now you can't see what pieces are there. And all of a sudden, something you thought was the queen, voila, it's revealed to be a bishop or something else. That's life. Life is based on uncertainties, on probabilities, on strategy that is not coming from this perfectly laid out board. There is no solution in poker, no limit hold'em, still has not been solved. Now, on the other side, you have games like roulette, the other games in a casino, and that's at the other end of the extreme. So those are games that are just absolute chance. There's no skill involved. And that is also boring, according to von Neumann, because you can't do anything. The outcome is going to be what it's going to be. And that's also not life. Um, but that is much more gambling and poker's in the middle and poker is a game of skill and it's not gambling and i spent many many days and hours and weeks trying to figure out how do i explain in one sentence why poker is a skill game because so many people ask me that and i think it comes down to the fact that in poker you can win with the worst hand and you can lose with the best hand. And that's not possible in any other game in a casino. Well, I think for me as a parent, I've been teaching my, I've been trying to teach my kids chess since they were very little. But you've actually said that you think that poker should be taught to kids in grade one. Why? Um, I have said that and I believe very strongly in it because I think that poker teaches you skills that are absolutely essential for thriving as an adult, for being a good thinker, for being a critical thinker. And by the way, I think kids should learn chess too. Why not learn both? That's great. I never learned chess. All I know is how the pieces move. And so I think that chess can teach you something interesting as well. But what poker teaches you is strategy on a different level. It teaches you to be comfortable with uncertainty, with not knowing. It teaches you about probabilities because you learn what different probabilities are like. You actually learn the types of things that are so hard for the human brain to learn otherwise because you're doing them, you're experiencing, you're learning the way that we learn best through doing. And you're actually figuring out, you know, what does it feel like to be a 2% favorite, to be a 70% favorite. Oh, I can be a huge favorite and still lose. That happens, and that doesn't mean I made the wrong decision. Fascinating. Poker teaches you emotional control and self-regulation, which is something that we've seen that if you learn as a little kid can actually help you thrive throughout your adult life because you have to learn how do I not take this personally? How do I get past my losses? How do I actually learn to control my emotions and to still think rationally, even though I might be upset? Poker teaches you to read other people, which in a poker context will help you beat them, but in a real life 
context can help you be much more empathetic, a better listener, someone who actually pays attention to the signs that other people are giving off, both verbal and nonverbal, which I think would be huge. I mean, imagine how much better society would be if we actually listened to each other and listened to the subtext of what people were saying. Oh, wow she's uncomfortable. Oh, wow. You know, he's feeling very angry for some reason. Those types of skills, I think, will get you incredibly far and will make you into just a better human being. And you learn that all at the poker table. Well, in what ways does poker mimic real life? Well, I think that most importantly is something that I've already touched on, which is that it is a game of imperfect information. So in real life, whenever you make a decision, we always want to know more, but we can never know everything because we don't know what other people are thinking. We don't know what other people know. All we know is what they're projecting, what they're telling us, what they're showing us. But there's so much else that's involved and we aren't privy to it. We need to learn to be comfortable with that and to try to make the best decision possible, knowing that we don't know everything. And we also need to try to calibrate just how certain we are of, of different elements of our decision process, which we're not used to doing. I mean, so many people just say, oh, yeah, you know, definitely this is this is the way to go. Well, in poker, you're actually forced to bet. And so you actually have to put money on these sorts of decisions. And so all of a sudden you have to ask yourself, wait, how certain am I? You know, am I 10% certain? Am I 30% certain? Am I 50% certain? Those are all very different levels of certainty. And by the way, I'm not the first person to say that. Um, Emmanuel Kant, way back when, who was also a gambler um, and a wanted to be a professional gambler at one point in his life, he writes very eloquently about how important it is to actually put kind of a monetary value on your opinions, on your certainty, because then you actually are forced to question how right you are, how good your information is, how good your thought process was, and ask yourself, okay, you know, am I willing to bet $10 on this? A hundred, a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand, my marriage? my life. And all of a sudden, I think people become much more humble. Because you have and something to lose, right? You have something to lose. Exactly. Um, one of the aha moments that I had reading this book is that you write that probability has amnesia. What did you mean by that? <laughs> I meant that we have this very simplistic view of what probability is supposed to look like. So let me take the simplest example, which is a coin toss. We know that a coin has heads and tails. So 50% of the time it lands heads and 50% tails. So if you flip it twice and it lands on heads both times, that's not so surprising. But if you flip it 10 times and it lands on heads every single time, you think, whoa, whoa, this is wrong. It's supposed to be landing on tails too. Well, the coin doesn't know that you're sitting there and you're waiting for it to land on tails because it's already landed on heads. It doesn't know that it's 50-50. And yes, over time, if we flip it a million times, it's going to be closer to 50-50. But 10 times in a row, sure, that can be all heads or all tails. And it's so funny because to us, something like that looks unnatural. We say, oh, this is rigged. This isn't normal. Well, real probability actually looks normal. And what is usually rigged is when it looks the way that we think it's going to look. Something I learned when uh, researching The Biggest Bluff I talked to a man who actually designs games, and he taught me that in a lot of games, the random number generators, the probability distributions are rigged to look more random to the average human, because when they had it be truly random, people complained and said, this game is horrible, this game is rigged, you can never win here, I can't believe I'm losing you know, 20 times in a row. So they realized, wow, Human brains don't like what probability actually looks like. The fact that it has amnesia and that every single outcome is totally independent. So let's make it resemble what people's intuition is like a little bit more. And if they're losing, let me let's get them a win. You know, let's let's actually jigger things a little bit so that the numbers look like their perceptions of what probability should look like. Now, poker doesn't do that. Poker doesn't pander to you. Poker actually forces you to confront the fact that probability does have amnesia and that you might be on a losing streak for a very long time or on a winning streak 
Although everyone seems to be okay with being on a winning streak all of a sudden, then that looks just I deserve, I deserve, I worked hard. Um, We are running out of time and I wish we had more time to talk, but I I have a a bunch of questions to get in. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. And um, in the book, you write about someone and you call them generously, I think, um, uh, aggressive idiot. Can you tell us the story of aggressive idiot? Yes. I mean, I, I... I called him a, a little bit more than that, but but we will call him for the audience aggressive idiot. So just by way of background, poker is 98% male. Just imagine that for a second. You are, as a woman, you can go days and days and days not playing with any men. And it turns out that oftentimes men don't like playing with women. And so I started off playing online because that's the way that you can really get a lot of experience very quickly. And I wanted to mimic what it would be like for me in real life. So I chose a screen name that made it obvious that I was female. And my avatar, which is, you know, the little face that appears whenever anyone plays with me, was a little puppy. So I tried to make myself, you know, as as cute and female as I possibly could. And we know that actually online there's a lot of data to support this. Men will bluff more against women. And so I had played with people before and online you can actually tag people and label them and I played with this person before and he was very nasty to me and was very aggressive and would always bully me and so I labeled him as an aggressive idiot because he was aggressive against me and he was idiotically so it was just over the top and so this was my breakthrough moment when I was playing with him and I realized wow you're going to underestimate me and you're going to be aggressive no matter what so why why don't I wait until I actually have a strong hand and let you give me all of my money? And that's exactly what I did. I let him bluff at me and bluff at me and I would fold and I didn't take it personally. I would say, okay, you know, it's fine. I'm not in a position to fight back. Then finally I had a very strong hand and I knocked him out of the tournament and I went on to win my first ever online poker tournament. And then I thank aggressive idiot in the book for, uh, for giving me that opportunity. Well, what I find so interesting about this book is that you uh, look at yourself really from a critical point of view. Um, and as you're learning, you realize that you have a lot to overcome, to overcome internally. What did you discover about yourself in terms of your struggle to play more aggressively? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's something that I'm still, that I'm still dealing with. Um, I started off not realizing just how much I'd internalized a lot of the roles, a lot of the stereotypes that society puts on you as a female. I'd always thought of myself as a pretty strong woman. You know, I've had career success, um, I've done well, and I thought I could stand up for myself. And what I discovered at the poker table was that that was absolutely not true, that I had learned to act in certain ways to minimize tension because I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to think well of me. And in order to do that, I wanted to not get in their way and to avoid aggression, to avoid conflict. And so I found myself at the poker table doing just that. I found myself folding when people were bullying me around saying, okay, okay, you know, you can take it. I don't need it that much. You just take it because I didn't want them to, you know, I didn't want that conflict at the table. When I had very strong hands, I wouldn't raise as aggressively. I would make less money even with my good cards because I wouldn't want them to say, oh, I hate her. You know, that's that nasty Maria girl who always raises me. I didn't want that either. And it was very hard for me to be aggressive because whenever I was aggressive, people would say not nice things to me and would make me feel like I didn't really belong there. And I, and I totally felt like an imposter as well. And so this made me, it was not a pleasant realization and I was losing a lot of money and it made me confront the fact that, wow, you know, I actually have internalized a lot of these social stereotypes and these norms of behavior and I don't like myself for it. That's not who I want to be. And so I had to work hard to try to overcome that and to try to figure out, okay, you know, you underestimate me. How do I not let you bully me? How do I use that against you? How do I actually turn it on its head so that I can so that I can win? And And when I did that. Sorry. And and you do win um, and not to be rude by talking about money. But what was the biggest part today that you've won? So I play tournament poker. um, And so it's uh, it's not a cash game where there are these huge pots because chips have no cash value. The biggest tournament I ever won um, with all of the 
with the with the total prizes and everything was um, a little over a hundred thousand dollars. I think the actual cash prize was eighty something thousand, maybe eighty five, um, and then there was also a thirty thousand um, dollar pass attached to it, which let me play in the biggest buy-in event I've ever played in in my life, a $25,000 tournament, which is crazy to me because um, my first salary out of college as a writer was $23,000. So the entry to this one tournament was more than my first annual salary. Well, I mean, the great thing about this book is that um, you learn so much about the game, but the game itself teaches you skills that maybe um, could have come in handy earlier on in life. Looking back in that process, that year process, what would you say was the best lesson, maybe the most helpful lesson that you wish you could have learned earlier? Oh, there are so many of them, but I think that the one that is the most important in how you make decisions is to learn to focus on the process, on the things that you can control and to let go of the outcome because the outcome is just chance. You can't control that. How do I put myself in a position to win? How do I put myself in a position to get lucky? And I do that by focusing on my decisions, on my emotions, on my actions, on my reactions. I don't do that by dwelling on the things that went wrong or by taking credit for the things that went right that had nothing to do with me. And learning that difference and learning to not judge myself based on the outcome, but based on the process, I think is very important. And also to learn that about other people. I think it makes you much less judgmental of others once you realize that, you know what, people did not necessarily make bad decisions if they are in a bad place and had bad outcomes. They might have made just as good a decision as you. You got lucky, they didn't. It's something that's just so important to remember all the time. And I think that playing poker has actually made me just much more grateful um, and much more cognizant of the role that chance plays in everyone's life. Um, And it's made me really want to make sure that when I'm lucky, that I pay that forward, that I actually use those opportunities to try to give some of that luck to as many people as I possibly can. We have about 30 seconds, but uh, did your Baba Anya eventually come around to you playing poker? (laughs) Um, You know what? I I hope so. Um, I had a chance to see her uh, very briefly right before all the lockdowns started for her 95th birthday in March. Um, Sorry, in February. And then in March, we were locked down. And she, for the first time, said, you know, I think that poker has taught you a lot and has opened up lots of doors for you. And so I think that she finally might have gotten it. And that makes me very happy. Maria, thank you so much for your time. Terrific book. Congratulations. Thank you so much for having me. It has been an absolute pleasure. Putting on a mask to go out in the world is standard practice now, but it's unlikely you've seen any quite like those inspired by a simple question posed by Métis artist from Newmarket, which became a call to beadwork artists around the world. Joining us now to explain from Ottawa is Shelby Lisk, our Ontario Hubs journalist covering Indigenous issues. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jan. So Shelby, let's get right into it. Uh, what was the question that sparked the Breathe project? So right at the beginning of COVID in the spring, we saw lots of people making all kinds of homemade masks. Um, And Natalie Burton, a Métis artist, she took to social media with the question, why haven't I seen any beaded masks? So as a Métis artist, you know, she talked to me about how in her culture, they bead everything. And and she wasn't seeing that from the Métis artist at the time. So this connected her with another Métis artist, Lisa Shepard. And together they started Breathe as a call out to beadwork artists to submit masks that are beaded in the traditional style of their nation or community. Now, this sounds like an obvious question. We're talking about masks, but why was the project called Breathe? Yeah, so I asked her that question and I thought it was kind of a silly question, but <laughs> she, yeah, I mean, for the obvious reasons, you know, we we need to breathe, these, we have to wear these masks now, but also because, you know, she described the situation that we're in right now as, you know, we all kind of don't know what's going to happen. We're all holding our breath. Um, and this is giving artists a space to process everything that's going on and kind of like relax, let go and and breathe. <laughs> now, like you had mentioned, this was a call out that started here in Canada, but has since gone international. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so they started the the call out as a Facebook page, um, which went live in April, and they asked artists to upload um, pictures of their masks. Um, and within the first two weeks, Natalie said they had over a thousand members, which they were not expecting um, from all over the world. And then within a few weeks of that, they started seeing masks coming in. Um, and now their page has about two, over 2,000 followers. They've had 300 different people submit masks, and it's they've been coming in from all over the world. So Canada and the U.S., but also they've had submissions from New Zealand, Australia, and Portugal, just to name a few. Now, I had a chance to go on the Facebook page, and I scroll through there, but is there an opportunity for people to see these masks in real life at all? Yes, yeah, so they did do two special call-outs that were specifically for an art exhibition. So right now they have an exhibition on view um, in Alberta at the White Museum in Banff, and it's going to be a traveling exhibition. So it is going to travel across the country, and it will be coming to Ontario in 2021. So you can watch out for the information about that. Now, what made you want to photograph these masks? On our website, we'll have, uh, we have 12 uh, masks on our website of 46, but what made you want to photograph them in the first place? Yeah, I saw I saw this when when these artists first started it, and I thought it was such a cool project. But I saw all kinds of media covering it, and so I wasn't really sure how I wanted to cover it, but in a different way, in a, in a TVO um, hubs way. And so when I saw that my community in Tyndanaga was doing their own challenge inspired by this, I thought that was perfect. Um, you know, this little this little challenge as a part of this big international story, and so. Um, I, I contacted them and they were really excited about it. And it was also something that was very manageable for me during COVID to be able to get to my community, you know, with all the restrictions and, um, you know, stay with my family while I was in the area. So there was also some practical um, restrictions around what I could do and um, doing it in my community really made it a lot easier. All right, so let's look at some. Um, the first one that we have looks sort of like a wedding mask. What can you tell us about this one? This is Carol Ann, um, and she comes from a family of beaters and leather workers and sewers in our community. So she's been beading since she was a little girl um, with her grandma and her mother. She told me that she, she's been beading for over 50 years now. Um, so this mask was inspired by she was supposed to get married in the fall um, of 2020, but as the provincial guidelines started coming out and they, and they realized with the restrictions that they, their wedding was not going to be possible, um, so they had to postpone it. And when this challenge came about, she knew that she wanted to make a wedding mask to commemorate that. Um, she said that she has made wedding dresses, wedding moccasins, wedding jewelry for people before, but she had never made a wedding mask. Um, so there's a ton of intricate details in the mask, um, down all the way to, you know, there's the tassels that are hanging down on the side. And she talked to me about those you know, sort of looking reminiscent of what a bride might wear uh, for earrings on her wedding day. Uh, I'm curious, you know, her wedding has been postponed. Does she plan to wear this mask on her wedding day? <laughs> I asked her that question as well, and she said uh, she hopes not, <laughs> because COVID should be over, hopefully, by the time they're getting married. Fair enough. Uh, let's bring up the second mask. Now, this one is a little more simpler than the first one. What can you tell us about this? I understand it's a tribute to someone. Yes, so the artist Tammy, she created this mask as a tribute to her father who passed away in April. And so because of the COVID restrictions that were going on, uh, her and her family weren't able to visit her father to say goodbye, um, to see him in his last moments or to have a funeral or anything like that to, to really start that grieving process. And so she created this mask as a way to remember him, but also as a way to you know work through some of that grief. Um, and her father was a musician. So you can see a tiny little music note in there amongst the flowers. And she also said that he always loved uh, the floral beadwork so she made that specifically for him all right so the third one actually has the image of a hummingbird is there a story there yeah so Callie um, she beaded the hummingbird on hers also in in memory of her late mother who um, the hummingbird was her favorite bird and then also you know making the mask in memory of her grandmother who was a beater and this mask is done entirely in rate in a raised beadwork style which is signature to Haudenosaunee beadwork um, it's not something that I've seen any other nations do um, so if you see any contemporary or antique pieces of beadwork that have this raised style is probably Haudenosaunee or Iroquois uh, beadwork. 
Now, I want to look at this fourth one. Now, this, I will admit, is probably my favorite one. Uh, it is a constellation mask. What is its significance? The mask um, here, it shows the story or the legend of the Big Dipper constellation. So there are many versions of this story. Um, and the one that I know um, in this sort of simplified version is that the stars that kind of uh, trail behind are um, symbolize these hunters and then the little cluster of stars symbolizes the bear and so the story is that these three hunters are chasing the bear and throughout the throughout the seasons the constellation changes in the sky so in the spring and summer um, the constellation looks like how we see it here um, with the hunters chasing the bear and then in the fall it tips um, so the bear would be um, underneath and in our in our legend we say that that is when the hunters catch up with the bear. Um, They're able to hunt him. And it is the bear's blood coming down from the sky that actually changes all the leaves uh, color in the fall. And then in the winter, you know, it keeps rotating and the bear is sort of upside down uh, sleeping um, until it comes to spring again when the hunters start their chase. <laughs> Now, if that's not an amazing story in itself, uh, that's, that's remarkable. But I understand there's also a, a really cool feature with this mask as well. Yes, uh, the beads actually all glow in the dark, which was really cool to see, but very hard to photograph. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, the last mask that we're going to show is, uh, is quite special and also includes you in there in that photo. Uh, tell us about this turtle mask. Yeah, so this is my mama. Um, she <laughs> is a very talented uh, sewer, um, quilter, you know, basically everything she can do with her hands. Um, but she never did beadwork uh, growing up. So that's something that she's been doing to reconnect to our culture and to our community. And so the mask that she's wearing has the turtle on it. Um, and she beaded that because our family is Turtle Clan. Um, and then she also beaded the mask that I'm wearing there in the photo with her. And so that's a symbol that uh, some people might recognize. It's the Hiawatha belt, which symbolizes the five nations coming together to form the Iroquois Confederacy. So that's sort of the symbolism um, on there. But it was really nice to be able to go back home. And I didn't know my mom was actually going to be a part of this challenge when I proposed this story. But um, it was really nice to have her be a subject and uh, to be able to be with my family for this story. Well, again, Shelby, again, another great story. I want to thank you so much. Uh, you can see the rest of the photo gallery on our website at tvo.org. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jan. The agenda this week learned how Ontario's court system is adapting to the pandemic, got some advice for parents on coping, and learned why Nobel Prize winning author Kazuo Ishiguro put hope at the heart of his new novel. The agenda's week in review begins talking to nurses about the front lines of this pandemic. Much of this province is going to reopen now in a way that it has not over the past month, and I'm wondering how that's going to have an impact on nurses. Well, I think that uh, most nurses right now, we have such a nursing shortage uh, at the hospitals, and certainly we're graduating a lot of students at Loyalist, and the, they're working two to three jobs, and it's getting very busy, and I do worry about uh, COVID fatigue with people not getting time off to recuperate and to um, rejuvenate who they are. What kind of time off are they getting in the midst of all this? Again, I can't speak exactly for everybody, but I can say that most of my graduates are working at least two to three jobs, and um, which is nice when you're a brand new grad, so you can pay off your loan. But over time, that can uh, lead to burnout. And I, probably everybody here on the panel will tell you that they are working um, at full tilt, 100% capacity as well. Are you hearing that from your former graduates, that they are, even at their young age, feeling burned out already? Some of them are. Yeah, some of them are. And uh, I do worry about them leaving the profession because it's, um, like I said, there we have such a nursing shortage. I don't know if people realize that. And there, um, you could, I, I would like to see more funding for nurses to come along. I mean, even right now, we're running a vaccine clinic at our college and we're using um, some of our, our students in that vaccine clinic. So there is a, a real need for nurses in this community. Hmm. Vicki, you're an ICU nurse on the front lines. What are you seeing from other nurses? Uh, yeah, I would have to agree. Um, we're, we're 
beyond burnt out at this time. There's a lot of fatigue that's going around. Um, and I think a lot of people are feeling a little bit hopeless about what their nursing career looks like ahead of them at this point. Um, I've been in nursing for 10 years at this point, and I never thought I would ever experience or have to work through a pandemic. So it has totally rocked a lot of us. I think emotionally we're all drained um, and we're a little concerned about how we're going to sort of pick ourselves up and keep going. Um, it's, it's a big concern for a lot of us right now. Vicky, have you thought about leaving the job? To be honest, yeah, from time to time. Um, but it keeps pulling me back because I love my nursing community. I love what I do. Um, I've worked in the trauma ICU for almost eight and a half years, and it's something that I can say that it's been a calling for mine. Um, it's something that there are days that you have those bright moments and you're able to help out a patient and everything connects and everything works out. And then COVID happens and you're not really sure what to do anymore, right? So um, it's definitely been on my mind, but nursing will always be my my passion, no matter what. And I, I well, listen, you tell me, but I'm going to guess that at various times over the past year, you have been the last human being that somebody's loved one has seen as they have died from COVID-19. Has that happened? Yeah, that's happened. Um, ooh, uh, it's a very emotional, visceral experience to be in. Um, not to say like we've had patients pass away in the ICU before pre-COVID and at least you were able to let families come in early and spend some last moments with them and actually detach from the situation. So you weren't a link in this person's memory of like seeing their last love, seeing their loved one for the last time. Now with COVID, you are, you are just linked into this whole entire memory and you want to give privacy and respect to the patient that is passing and to their family, but you're not able to all the time, right? So um, sometimes you have to replace that family member and be the sea filler until somebody can come and see them. And it's a burden and an emotional toll that I don't think any of us knew that we were signing up for at the beginning of this pandemic. Hmm. Amy, how have you managed the past year? Oh my goodness. You know, honestly, one of the things that I would speak to is I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm fortunate that I actually have my own little outlet, which is our podcast. And through talking to other people and bringing other people's experience to the forefront, I feel that's one of the ways that I've been able to cope because it's it's been tough. And also with being with um, kind of working and overseeing kind of the emergency departments, this is the door, the window where everyone comes in. And it's it's tough knowing that, you know, my fellow colleagues are under this amount of stress and sometimes even feeling like I can't even help them or I can't support them the way that I'd like to. So it's been, it's been, it's been really challenging. You know, Janet, how are you and your colleagues balancing all of your professional obligations to continue to go to a workplace while at the same time, I presume deal with kids, deal with aging parents, deal with everything you've got, also got to deal with on that so-called second shift? Yeah, everybody's got something else outside of work. You know, I have two small children that are school aged um, and can't stay home by themselves. They're in grade uh, two and grade and kindergarten. So uh, I needed somebody uh, to watch my children uh, when Ontario shut down. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate. I had a cousin that was. Um, finishing up her first year university and she um, jumped to the opportunity to help and took my kids in a second because my husband's also an essential worker. Just as you're doing with, with your show, uh, we've been able to, to conduct hearings to, to sometimes in person, but where conditions required it remotely and also through, through the uh, the media we've used, we've been able to keep the courts open, whether by by audio in some cases or by video. Uh, we've made the courts accessible to the public at large. Even two weeks ago, we had a case in our court where we had more than 500 viewers watching watching the case. And as you probably saw last week, uh, Chief Justice Morowitz's court dealt with an important uh, public matter, a sentencing matter in which hundreds and hundreds of viewers watch. So 
overall, I think we uh, that was job one, and we're fairly comfortable with how we've dealt with it. All right, let me pick up the story with Mr. Justice Morowitz. I, I know I've talked to people in the post-secondary world who have said that they managed to do, essentially in a few weekends, what it otherwise would have taken 10 years to do, namely move thousands of courses from the classroom to online. Uh, in your case, what did you discover about either how quickly or how difficult it was to pivot to include online in the way you do your work? Well, thanks, Steve. Um, it was a challenge. We'll put it that way. Uh, this is a profession, a legal profession, that is steeped in tradition. And we're talking a process where the courts were operating paper-based. And that has been the way in which it's been done for hundreds of years. Bankers' boxes would arrive daily for each judge. You'd lug the, the work home. You'd do it sometimes at home, sometimes at the office, but all of it was in paper, and all of a sudden, you did not have that available to you. We had tremendous cooperation from the entire legal community, and I'll start with our judges. You know, in our court, there's 335 across the province. You know, to a person, they were all saying, what can I do to help? Bar associations, local bar associations, and specifically, I'll give a shout out to the Ontario Bar Association and the Advocate Society for immediate assistance that they provided. The Ministry of the Attorney General, again, came to the, you know, to the realization that we have to do something instantly. So we started with rudimentary email to exchange files, and the bar was great in, in providing great assistance there. Then we've gradually morphed into um, the Zoom for a Zoom platform for video hearings. We were doing most of them by teleconference. But the result has been, um, since then, we've now adopted uh, case lines as a document sharing platform, so that we now can get the documents to judges, to parties, and right seamlessly right through to a hearing and that is a uh, in process but it's going to be finalized by uh, another couple months right across the province so we have been able and i'm very happy to say and proud to say that we're closing in on uh, 100,000 virtual hearings in our court since the pandemic started hmm. uh, it took a pandemic to achieve to you know jump started because we've been asking for this technology for years uh, but now it has been delivered we're not all the way there we still have a long way to go but we've survived and flourished and been able, as uh, Chief Strathy said, keep the doors open and keep justice moving. Well, that leads nicely to my next question for uh, Madam Justice Mezenov, which is, and don't take this the wrong way, but, but our generation tend to be digital immigrants, I've heard the expression, uh, as opposed to digital natives, which uh, our kids and grandkids may be. So some of this stuff doesn't necessarily come as easily to us as it does to younger people. How much of an adjustment was it for you and your colleagues to do your work under these new circumstances. So Steve, you, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, it was an incredible adjustment uh, to move to what I would call a largely virtual environment, basically overnight, as described by my two colleagues, was was enormous. And for the judicial officers, uh, you know, in the Ontario Court of Justice, we have 750 judicial officers. It varied. Some were much more comfortable with technologies than others, and we had to answer those needs and support them to move to a virtual world. But they, in, in all three courts, I think everybody stepped up and learned what they had to learn to be, as Chief Justice Morris said, just make it happen for us to continue to, to serving the, the public. And of course, you have to understand, Steve, that the technology, as mentioned by my colleagues, was not available everywhere. Uh, to move to a... Um, you know, a virtual platform in a large urban center is much easier than in a, a satellite court in Northern Ontario, for example, where the technology is just not uh, available as, as, as available as elsewhere. And I think you need to understand the, the scale of the operation of the three courts. Uh, you know, in the entire Court of Justice, we preside in more than 200 locations in seven judicial regions. In the Spirit Court of Justice, uh, they sit in 52 locations across eight judicial regions. And of course, we have the Court of Appeal. Uh, you know, in, in a year, on average, we receive approximately 240,000 new cases, and that's just criminal cases, and approximately 14,000 family matters per year. And of course, that does not include the, the uh, Provincial Offences Act, which is close to uh, 1 million at times. Um, so, and then of course, you've got the Spear Court, uh, the, both courts, 
we deal both with criminal and family, but the Superior Court also deals with civil matters. And then you have the Court of Appeal, who uh, approximately receives 1,200 appeals per year. So you can imagine how wide uh, and how vast it is. Last October, Statistics Canada released some numbers ranking how concerned parents were with balancing school, child care, and work. And the results show that 71% of parents surveyed were concerned about their child's opportunities to socialize with their friends. 64% were concerned about their children feeling lonely or isolated. 46% worried about the overall mental health of their child. And 40% fretted about schoolwork and academic success. Um, and when you look at those numbers, is it notable that parents are more concerned about their children's social lives than they are about their schoolwork? I think it makes total sense. I mean, um, I think we're all really craving that human contact. And especially for kids at particular developmental stages, like I feel so sorry for teenagers. I mean, this is a time in your life when you're supposed to be being social and having a private life. And the pandemic has forced you to be treated like a five-year-old. So that must be exceptionally challenging for, for parents and for teens right now. Tanya, I saw you nodding. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, you know, um, Anne said it best, too, in terms of the socialization, because they learn so much. When they're on a playground, they learn how to win, they learn how to lose, they learn how to deal with peer pressure. Mm. You you can't learn those things if you're an only child, <laughs> you know, in a house with an adult <laughs> who's on a computer all day. And what is this going to lead long-term-wise, like how they're going to learn how to interact with um, their peers when they're in an office setting, if office settings are still a thing, and in 10, 15 years. So it does make sense. And I know that, you know, teachers and boards are doing the best that they can to try and make sure that children don't fall behind. I know that some kids are flourishing in this virtual learning because they're not good in classroom settings, whereas other kids, now that the classroom sizes are smaller, they're getting a little bit more attention. So we don't have to necessarily worry as much academically as we do for the other extras. Tanya, you mentioned that you are a single parent. How are you, can you, you know, how are you managing to be productive while doing everything else that you've had to deal with with your son? Uh, define productive. <laughs> um, I, you know, there's days where I just give myself the grace to say, I don't have it. Um, I might follow up with people saying, you know what, you're going to get this by end of week. So I can give myself an extra few days. Um, I try to use, um, calendar schedule tools so I can know what my schedule is like. Um, you know, I make sure that times are blocked off for drop off and pick up times from school. Um, I try my best, but it's it's really, really difficult because sometimes it's just, you know, getting out of bed and putting food in your mouth for breakfast is the, the only thing I can accomplish. And sometimes that has to be okay. Um, and I've also been hearing, even for me personally, I have, my days are very long. Um, and Ed, we've heard how in two parent cisgender relationships, women are still shouldering most of the work. Uh, why do you think that's, that is? I think one of the reasons is a lot of fathers don't know where to start and a lot of things too that they haven't been taught. And also too, a lot of fathers haven't had that, a lot of fathers haven't had the experience when they were raised by their fathers. So a lot of times they're, they've been so unfortunately focused on providing, especially providing through the workplace that they haven't thought about there is another side of life. So they think about the traditional this, this, and this. Now, with the pandemic, sometimes they feel like they're a father out in the middle of the sea and they don't know what to do. You know, the kids are coming to saying, Daddy, this, Daddy, that. And sometimes, unfortunately, the father hasn't paid a lot of attention to what's going on with their child or children in school, in everyday life. So it's, it's not a perfect situation for anybody. But as I said, and we'll get to later, more dads are getting engaged now. So that's a good side of the pandemic. Um, and Anne, you know, uh, Tanya mentioned the screen time. Um, we've all, I think from the time that I have my kids, my eldest is uh, uh, 10, uh, limit screen time. But now screen time learning, um, <laughs> their friends, it's uh, a connection to the outside world. How can parents balance screen time with physical activity? Yeah, if you can get I outside? think... 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I think lose a little bit of the guilt around that because I've had so many parents say to me, you know, for, for years we've been hearing all this stuff about, you know, limit the screen time in this way. And I think the wisest thing I've heard is to look at how the screen is being used as opposed to just narrowly counting, you know, setting like a, you know, a stopwatch or something. Think about like, are they connecting with family across the miles or is this their, their friend hangout as opposed to just, you know, treating scrolling through Instagram and feeling badly because your post hasn't been liked as the equivalent of, you know, playing a card game remotely with your grandparents. We'd like to think that there is something so utterly unique about us that there's only one of us in the entire universe and couldn't possibly be replicated. You are, you are positing with us the notion that we maybe ought not to be that cocky about our uniqueness. This is, were you as uncomfortable writing this as I was reading it? Yes, yes, I mean, uh, um, and I, I suppose, you know, I try to address that. Well, at least Clara tries to address it, you know, in, in the final passages of the, of the book. But um, it, it is a notion that I feel is creeping up on us. Uh, I think for, for centuries and centuries, you know, we human beings, we've even long after we've, many of us have stopped believing in God in the old fashioned way or a relationship between our soul and God in the classic kind of religious sense long after we've kind of stopped believing that in any literal way i um we have held on to this idea that there is some kind of a soul or something unique some invisible ghost you know that, that occupies our bodies um and and it's because of that that it makes sense when i say something like uh, you know i love my wife or i love my daughter uh, there's something actually unique about my wife and my daughter that that makes love in that human context um, something meaningful now because we live in a world where big data algorithms um, and, and artificial intelligence is becoming more and more every day and every time we go shopping online or um, we, we try and uh, download a movie or something um, we get people predicting what what we'd want to see next week and, and what we might want to shop for next week. I mean, uh, possibly I'm saying that we might be getting to a point where we start to actually question a lot of these assumptions on which we've organized family life. And I have to say in, in the larger sense, um, our societies around the notion that the individual is a sacrosanct unit uh, upon which we have to build all our political systems. Um, we might start to be tempted to think, actually, we're not that complex or unique. We're, we're you know, we're a bunch of algorithms. Um, and this is some sort of superstition from the past that we're hanging on to. So, th so that's the idea that, that, that that's being um, interrogated, I guess, by the characters in this book, not in an intellectual way, but in an emotional way, because we have a situation in this family where, where the daughter is pretty sick. And um, I guess the mother is trying to, uh, to preempt you know, utter, an utter sense of loss and bereavement and, and is wondering if this is some way out of it. Hmm. You know, one of the really fascinating choices you made in writing this book, and obviously... I mean, you're a man in your 60s, so I'm not saying that every book you write has to be narrated by a man in his 60s, but you are narrating this book as an artificial intelligence young girl. And I wonder how tricky that is for you, since that's not who you are. Well, I've never, I've never narrated from uh, people who are like me. When I was, when I was a young writer, uh, you know, my first novel I wrote in my 20s, uh, the novel that was mentioned in the introduction, The Remains of the Day, I wrote in my, uh, in my early 30s. Uh, the narrators were always elderly people looking back on their lives. You know, um, I've always found it easier uh, to write from the perspective of characters who are not like me. And I, I've always been drawn to writing from the point of view of um, outsiders, you know, people who are slightly outside uh, the society, or in this case, outside of the human race. Uh, because um, it's, it provides these kind of uh, tremendous focusing opportunities. If you've got somebody strange like Clara, she's almost like an alien. 
it's very natural for her to ask these questions, which in other contexts might seem rather over philosophical or even pretentious. You know, it's very natural for this naive, sweet machine type girl to to ask questions like, uh, you know, why do human beings have loneliness? Yeah, you know, are they fundamentally lonely? That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, March 12th, 2021. Next week marks one year since Ontario first declared a state of emergency due to the pandemic. We'll look at what we've learned about how it spread, explore how seniors not in long-term care have fared, and as part of our TVO Toronto Star joint initiative, the Democracy Agenda, assess the toll the pandemic's taken on democratic government across the globe. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, thank you for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.